the way board games and politics. So, um, in case that wasn't clear, I've got a picture of some board games politics. I'm also going to be talking about board games politics. Board games and politics. Now, you might think these are two things that have got nothing to do. Sorry about that. Just live with it momentarily. For another five years. Um, you might think these got nothing to do with each other. Um, like artichokes and, say, wigwams, or diagrams of submarines and, um, what is that again? Venereal disease. I'm going to convince you otherwise, and the best way to start any talk like this, I reckon, is with a really clever quote. So here we've got George Orwell, who said, the opinion that art should have nothing to do with politics is itself a political attitude. Hmm. Think about that. Nice one, George. Um, I'm not going to argue that board games are a kind of art form, because I think actually they're much better than art. So this quote needs some tweaking. There's no record that George Orwell ever played many board games, but I reckon if he is around now, he would have said the opinion that games should have nothing to do with politics is itself a political attitude. But even if he was, he can't. Because I got there first. Yeah. I didn't realise it was going to be quite so big. Anyway, it took me about a week to grow that. Um, that's a clever quote, right? Nice one, nice one, me. Anyway, I've always been interested in. Um, oh, it's just more things of politics and board games, you don't need to go back. This is a game I made at Sixth Form called Ideology. It's a prototype I made. The idea is simple one player plays the communists and one player plays the fascists, right? And you can build up a real life political party. So you've got Karl Marx, Lenin, Che Guevara, Vinnie Jones. As the face of left wing fuggery. I don't know why I did that. But the game is, is deeply flawed because I rated cards based on what I thought at the time, with no attempt to balance it whatsoever. Um, so a communist victory was more or less built into the game. <laughs> Admittedly, the fascists had uh, Hitler's got some pretty good stats 10 for oratory, 10 for leader, but then you've got idiots like Robert McDonald letting the side down. So the red team always wins. Hurrah! Oh, power to the people. Um, maybe that's cathartic, but it hardly makes for a good game, right? But there are loads of published games in which certain assumptions are embedded in the rules, and you don't need to look far for examples. When most people think of board games, they think of Monopoly. And when most people think of Monopoly, they think of endless, tedious hours locked in an unbreakable loop of frustration, disappointment, mild anxiety, occasional moments of gleeful revenge, more disappointment, and the unnerving experience of watching their family members turning into ruthless, money-grubbing bastards. <laughs> this is a game that is so effective at inducing a frenzied state of greed that most players end up begrudging their mates a 10 quid birthday present, even when they own half of London. <laughs> So, I think it's fair to say there's something political going on. Something a little bit political going on here. Um, get them when they're young, that's the idea, right? It, it wouldn't be so bad if the game hadn't been so wildly successful. But Monopoly spawned countless imitators, like this sinister game from 1980 called Pol Economy. In this players are business tycoons who buy up companies and bonds whilst jostling for political power in order to further their financial interests in government. Now, what some people might call corruption is treated in the game as entirely normal, and there's a reason for that. Um, the, the rule book is designed, the rule book of the UK edition is designed to look like the Financial Times, so you kind of know where it's coming from. Um, but it's not just a simulation of corporate intrigue, it's also an example of it. Because there's an Australian lobbyist group sponsored this game as a means to teach school children about the free enterprise system. The New Zealand Stock Exchange was involved in the launch in Auckland and a libertarian think tank called the Fraser Institute brought the game to Canada a few years later. In the game, you can buy up real companies like PG Tips and win our dog food. These companies actually paid real money to have their adverts printed on the board, and these adverts were sold by stockbrokers. 
In fact, this game was credited with, help, with helping the Fraser Institute survive the early 80s recession. So this isn't even a case of unconscious political assumptions making their way into a game. The International New Right Project that started in the 70s and helped propel Thatcher and Reagan into power is actually using board games to further the agenda, the neoliberal agenda, which is frightening and ludicrous, but not as ludicrous as this. The Donald Trump board game. <laughs> First release released in 1989, right? You done? Yeah. Um, so, in 1989, he made this game. There he is looking young and fresh-faced and possibly even smugger than he looks now. I don't know if you can see the, the top. It says, it's not whether you win or lose, but whether you win. It sounds, as a slogan, it sounds kind of snappy until you realise it doesn't mean anything. Um, it's kind of an early example of Trump's trademark style of no-nonsense nonsense. He said at the launch that this game would be the game for the 90s, which it wasn't. He also said all his proceeds would go to charity, which it didn't, by all accounts. So already at this early stage in his career, he was pulling off a triple combo involving a nonsensical slogan, a woefully misjudged prediction, and a self-serving lie. It's pretty good going, 1989. I'm going to try and play you a TV advert from the time. Whether it works, I don't know. Let's see what happens. Everything's set for tonight, Mr. Trump. I wonder what Trump's game is this time. Trump's got a new game. Trump's got a new deal. What's your game now? Trump has a new game. What is it? My new game is Trump. The game. Trump. The game. Because it's not what you win or lose. It's whether you win. Trump, the game, from I think you'll like it. Mr. the game will be donated to charity. I think you'll like it. That slogan at least makes sense, even if it was wrong, because this game bombed massively. It was re-released in 2004. 2004? There we go. When he was on The Apprentice, with a different smug picture, and it bombed again. I don't know how the game works, I don't really want to, but uh, his face is on every card, every banknote, the counter's a T-shaped, there's even a T on the bloody dice, right? Um, Time magazine included this in the list of Trump's 10 biggest failures, and it was actually included in a Swedish museum of failure, what, whatever that means. Um, but it's not whether you win or lose, is it, Donald? This is um, another example of a game with a capitalist message. Um, there's other games, a long history of games that have tried to deal with different sort of politics. A straightforward example is anti-monopoly. So, released in 1973, this game is almost literally monopoly in reverse. Players take on the role of federal caseworkers trying to bring indictments against corporations to break up their businesses. <laughs> Which doesn't really sound that riveting, does it? <laughs> but what came out of the game is fascinating, because in 1974, this guy, Ralph Ansbach, who is an American economics professor, he was sued by Parker Brothers for trademark infringement. What followed was a 10-year legal battle, which is even longer than most games of Monopoly. <laughs> Though the official history of the game holds that it was invented during the Great Depression by an out-of-work salesman called Charles Darrow, who sold his idea to Parker Brothers and went on to become a millionaire. It must have taken them quite a long time if they were paying them five hundreds. <laughs> but the court case, however, it was discovered that his version of Monopoly was highly derivative of an earlier game that had been in circulation for decades. So Ralph Ansbach, the guy from Anti-Monopoly, learned that the original incarnation of Monopoly had been invented at the turn of the 20th century by a journalist called Elizabeth McGee, who um, was a progressive feminist and worked as a secretary, a comedian, a poet and a games designer. She was also a passionate advocate of Henry George's theory of land value tax and filed a painting in 1903 for a game she hoped would spread the theory 
originally called the Landlord's Game, her invention was actually intended to show the evils of the property system. It didn't make an immediate impact, but it filtered through university people and Quakers and uh, progressive circles. Here's a, here's a version from 1906, and it looks pretty familiar already. Um, if you notice, the parking is a poorhouse now. But, so the game sort of twickled into the public domain over the next 30 years with people making their own versions, adapting the rules and even changing the name. Charles Darrow played the game and liked it so much, he made his own copy and then sold it to Parker Brothers. So Darrow's Rags to Witches story, which had been passed down by generations of American families as a kind of depression era parable, was a lie based on an act of plagiarism aided by an unscrupulous company who continued to perpetrate the lie up through the 70s when they got sued. It's no surprise Elizabeth McGee's radical message got lost along the way. But uh, Ralph Ansbach won his court case, his game was allowed to keep its name. It's interesting how anti-monopoly started life, but it was a corrective to a game that started life along the same lines. So, what happened to Parker Brothers? Well, in 1968, the company was acquired by General Mills, merged with toy makers Ken and later sold to Tonka in 1991. Tonka was acquired by Hasbro, had already bought out MB Games and went up to buy a new bunch of other companies throughout the 90s. In 1995, Hasbro even attempted to merge with the biggest rivals, Mattel, who had been busy buying out the other half of the toy games industry. In case anyone's confused, I've made you a helpful flowchart. <laughs> Got that? We'll move on. So, not only has the public's idea of board games been monopolised by the board game Monopoly, but the company that makes Monopoly has also tried to monopolise the very word Monopoly at the same time as heading towards an actual Monopoly based partly on the popularity of the board game Monopoly. Who <laughs> <laughs> fancies a drinking game whenever I say Otter? <laughs> There's going to be plenty more chances. And that's because no other game has been so successful in the same way that people kind of sp spoof pop music, pop songs, um, people make rift on the idea of Monopoly as a way sometimes to do, to overload different sort of politics, sometimes it's to show different kind of lifestyle. For instance, in 1980, we had Gay Monopoly, um, which shouldn't be confused with Gayopoly, completely different game, or even Homnopolis, which is either some kind of clever Greek wordplay or gay slang that I don't quite understand. In this game, the playing pieces are cell phones because only gay people use mobile phones, right? And instead of prison, we have a sex dungeon. Go directly to the sex dungeon. Do not pass go. Um, that's not all. We've got um, Bibleopoly. Yay! where players work together to build churches. <laughs> and you can win money by reciting passages from the Bible. Um, why the train stations in this game are being replaced by abyss squares, which are presumably stations operated by Southern Rail. <laughs> there is a company in America that exists purely to make custom Opoly games, and they've got a range of hundreds, including Shark Opoly, DIY Opoly! Chihuahua Opoly! <laughs> and my favourite, Bacon Opoly! <coughs> this is a real game, right? The street names have been replaced by bacon products of varying quality. Old Ken Road is now known as Bacon Grease. And as you go round, you can buy bacon vodka, bacon lip balm, bacon covered, <laughs> chocolate covered bacon on a stick. But this company avoided the lawsuit, so many of them got sued. But this one uh, changed the names slightly and renamed all the trademarks. However, that didn't save another game, a 2003 game called Ghettoopoly, which was so racist nobody really minded when Parker Brothers moved into sue. The cards in this game say stuff like, you got your whole neighborhood addicted to crack, crack $50. Now, I know what you're thinking, $50, that's some pretty cheap crap, right? <laughs> it sounds awful, but there were some games that tried to genuinely tackle racism. Well, unfortunately, it haven't always worked. 
There was this one, Blacks and Whites, which came out in 1970. It was published by Psychology Today magazine. And it, it was actually intended to teach white middle class players about racial privilege. But it did this by making it utterly impossible for the black players to win. <laughs> the white players start with a million dollars each. Uh, the black players are prevented from buying the most desirable properties and actually banned from certain parts of the board. It might be wrong, it sounds a bit shit. It's a sort of noble aim, but the medium and the message are out of whack. Um, which is not a problem this game has. Life as a black man. Though it clearly has other problems. Released in 1999, this game was at least made by a black man and kind of does what it says on the garish box. But if you didn't know that, it would be hard to distinguish it from the questionable parody. Uh, to explain what I mean, I've got another TV commercial. Hopefully this one will work. Again, <coughs> I think this is from the late 90s. Imagine seeing this on telly. Do you understand now? Do you understand? Bizarrely, there's a, there's a phone app made by the same guy who actually seems to be in earnest about the game's message. Um, but this game and Black for Whites, they crop up in a lot of these internet lists of the most disturbing games ever made. But in both cases, I think they were genuine efforts to treat racist, racism in a game in a, in a sort of positive way. Which isn't something you can say about this game, which is actually disturbing, because it's from Nazi Germany. It's made in 1936. It's called Jude and Rouse, which translates as Jews out. You win by moving the figures to the collection points outside the city to be deported to Palestine. And the counters look like this. I think the Jews are the cones that fit on the players' pointy hats. Adverts from the time claim the game sold a million copies other sources suggest it sold so poorly it was given away, or that it was, there was only over two prototypes. What we do know is that it wasn't made or even endorsed by the Nazi party. Although Joseph Goebbels was interested in the use of ball games, bizarrely, as propaganda, and the Nazis did produce some during the war, this one was actually made by a private company. They describe it in the rule book as an up-to-date and outstandingly jolly party game for grown-ups and children. <clears throat> what can I say? Interestingly, even the Nazis were against this, right? There was an SS newspaper at the time <clears throat> said the political slogan, Jews Out, is exploited here as a big seller for toy shops and trivialised as an amusing pastime for little children. The invention is almost a punishable idea perfectly suitable as grist to the mills of hate of the international Jewish press. Jews out, yes of course, but also rapidly out the toy boxes of the children before they are led into the dreadful error that political problems are solved with the dice cup. So the SS game reviewer <coughs> was worried that the Nazi cause was too noble to be given this kind of treatment, as if the ideology of the Third Reich was so fragile it could have been toppled by an outstandingly jolly party game. If only we'd known that at the time. I just solved a lot of bother from them, all that war. A similar argument was made by some on the left about this game, Class Struggle, came out in 1978, they thought they were trivialising it. This was made by a New York, New York uh, politics professor called Bert L. Ullman. What I like about Ullman is that he looks exactly what you'd imagine a New York politics professor to look like. <laughs> Warner Brothers bought the rights to make the film of this guy's life, which must be a first for any games designer. Um, the game itself is a light-hearted attempt to map left-wing ideas onto the format of a board game, and it tries to make this, tries to do this, a polemical point in the very first rule, right? Whoever rolls a certain symbol on the luck of birth dice gets the players the capitalist. Everyone has a chance and it goes round, but it starts with the lightest white male. 
and goes ends with the darkest black female. So the play's race and gender actually affects the setup of the game. Before you've even played it, you've already been segregated. You have been laid off from work, says one of the cards. If you blame yourself or a foreign competition or the blacks or the Jews, move two spaces back. If you blame the capitalists, move two spaces forward. Also squares like this. Government or destruction of all copies of the dangerous game class topic. Maybe too late, however. The government didn't go after Ullman, but um, some kind of conservative journalists kicked up a controversy about his politics, so he lost out on a prestigious promotion at the university. He got uh, endless hassle from toy salesmen, manufacturers always delaying their orders, not doing it. And he, he even got death threats. Imagine in, in, seven, in the 70s, this game. It, it ruined his life for about five years. Um, there was other games like this that got in trouble because of the theme. One is called War on Terror. This was made by some Cambridge friends in 2006. It plays a bit like Risk, except you can uh, use weapons of mass destruction to new countries and steal their oil. It also comes with a balaclava, which players have to wear when you become a rogue state. Um, it's, a, it's a cynical game, right? It makes a serious point, but a lot of people have got twitchy due to the theme and the timing during our war. It was banned from toy fairs, delayed at customs, and um, it was recalled from stay from stores on the actual day it was released. They were pulling it from the shelves. But, it, oh, and it also triggered incendiary headlines like this one. <clears throat> but, absurdly, a copy of the game was seized by Kent police at a climate camp change, uh, a climate camp demo, on the grounds that the balaclava could be used to conceal someone's identity in the course of a criminal act. There are many things that can be used to conceal someone's identity, so presumably it's also legal now to have a beard or a hat. Besides, like um, balaclavas, you can buy them in any army surplus shop. And the one in the game has the word evil written on the top, which you presumably would make the police's job easier. But despite all of that, or maybe because of it a bit, it was a massive hit. Um, it's polemical and the humour is caustic, but it's also something you might want to play. The company that produced this also made Crunch, the game for utter bankers, and Trump Trumps. Um, I apologise for making you look at his face again. Anyway, so we've seen how the games industry has sometimes hindered board games that take a decidedly political approach, but things are kind of improving a bit, partly because the nature of gaming has changed so much in recent years. For a long time, board games were seen as either a festive family pastime or an all-consuming hobby for nerdy boys, but those audiences have merged and morphed quite a lot to the point where there's 20, 20 gaming cafes opening up all across the country. This one's from London. Sort of was probably a nightclub before. Before the smoke, smoking pan gaming, the no one to nightclubs. But you can see it's taken on the, the hipsters are getting into games, which is a strange position to be in. Um, at this point, well, we've, had, we've had a clever quote. We've had a helpful flow chart. Who wants a graph? <laughs> there we have the graph has arrived On this, this shows a number of new board games that were released every year during the 20th century um, as you can see the demographic shift I was talking about has been accompanied by a massive explosion there were 5,000 released in 2016 5,000 new games right? so if political games used to lose out on the fight for shelf space, this new climate is much more likely to encourage and foster games that tackle big themes and encourage debate amongst players. And there's weird and wonderful titles coming out all the time, um, like this one, by my graph. This one, you play a League of Nations delegate who has to broker treaties at the same time as escaping from a troop of insane Swiss axe jugglers. <laughs> It's called, oh my god, there's an axe in my head. <laughs> um, I also found a game that had the same name as the game I made at Sixth Form, Ideology. I really like this game, but the box art is really bad. So let's zoom on. 
I think it's meant to be Stalin, Ayatollah, Kaiser Wilhelm, Teddy Roosevelt and Churchill. And I like the idea that all these guys would be in the same room together playing a board game, right? Not just any board game, it's a board game all about themselves. So perhaps one day, things like this could be used to facilitate conflict resolution amongst world leaders, or at least give them something better to do. We're at the end now, so, but I hope I've shown that just as every politician doesn't always lie, cheat and steal, Gangs that don't always have to support capitalism and war, and they can probe politics without causing an outburst of frustration or aggravation. Anyway, I'm sorry, but my time is up, so I've got to go. <laughs> adverts on the board. Um, perhaps more the, the backside is, is the weird part of that. But, you know, there's finding a balaclava in the board game was, <laughs> was, was, was up there. I've played, I've, I've played, yeah, and worn that balaclava. There's a, there's a photo gallery online of all the players wearing the balaclava, but you can upload your photo to me. Apparently, um, one of the people that made War on Terror lived in Hastings, which I didn't know. It's high tide cycles. Yeah. Pardon? It has high tide cycles. You run the bike shop, yeah, do you? Andy, yeah. right. They had a board game, uh, the Andy Albion. Board game. Andy Albion? Yeah. There we go. And if you've got any converts here. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yeah. 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 Then um, <coughs> let me thank Ben for a fabulous.